Shall we bow our heads in a word of prayer? Father, again we come in the precious name of Jesus, asking for a new anointing from heaven and for divine illumination upon the word. Speak to our hearts once again, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I want us to turn to the book of Judges, the sixth chapter. <clears throat> And begin reading Judges chapter 6, and begin reading with verse 6. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage. And I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all that oppressed you and drave them out from before you and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. <clears throat> Fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell, but ye have not obeyed my voice. Now, the, the one speaking here is telling them why They've been in all this difficulty in the book of Judges. You remember how they would get a deliverer and then get back into bondage. But here God is sending them another deliverer. And said, And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was in Ophrah, that pertaineth to Joash and the Abizarite, and his son Gideon thrashed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee. Thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then has all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles, which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hand of the Midianites. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his precious word. If I want to pick up one little part in this text, I want to say this of Gideon. If you remember here, the children of Israel, <clears throat> the Israelites, were oppressed and in hiding because of the Midianites. And here's Gideon behind the wine press trying to thrash out a little bit of wheat. And the Lord came, the, the angel came to him and said unto him, Gideon, thou mighty man of valor, and uh, that probably astounded him. He said the, the, that God is going to deliver thee. And Gideon asked him a question. He said, if God's with us, where are the miracles? Now Gideon knew that if God was with his people, there would be constant miracles one after another. He knew that. And there hadn't been, and so he's asking this question, if God's with us, where are the miracles? Isn't God wonderful? This morning our pastor gave us 24 years of miracles. <laughs> For 24 years, one after another. And my text tonight is where are the miracles, and our pastor gave them first for 24 years. If God's with us, where are they? Well, our pastor told us this morning for 24 years, he told you where the miracles are. Isn't God wonderful? <laughs> so Gideon's answer was, where are the miracles that our fathers saw? We want to know where they are. Well, our pastor reviewed them this morning and gave them to us, and I'm so thankful. So the church has pro this church has probably seen more miracles than most churches. And because Israel sinned, of course, the miracle ceased. But I want you to know that Christianity, true Christianity, is a religion of miracles. Now, I don't mean miracles to show off. You take, for instance, Jesus' temptation when the devil tempted him to cast himself down from the temple and show off, he refused to do it. And God still refuses today. When Herod wanted a miracle, he refused to give it. But I mean miracles in your personal lives. I don't mean even just 
miracles in service. It's wonderful. God does miracles for us in services like this. But I'm talking about miracles in your personal life that if you're a true follower of Jesus, you're going to experience miracles in your life. I remember hearing Dick Hillis one time, this great missionary to China, was with the China Inland Mission uh, for, I don't know how many, 17 years, I think. And then when the communists came and chased him out, he went to Formosa. And Dick uh, said this, and I, I've never forgotten it. He said to the people he was preaching to, he said, make yourself a candidate for miracles. In the Holy Ghost Awakening, we're going to see many miracles, but make yourself a candidate for miracles. Well, how are you going to do that? Well, now, hang on to your seat. The first one is by tithing. If you, if you tithe, you're experiencing miracles. Miracles are connected with tithing. God said, if you will bring the tithe into the storehouse, I'll pour you out blessings that you can't contain. He said, to prove me, you try me, you see now, and God's going to work miracles if a man will tithe. Yeah, right. Now, I, I want you to know, it seems like so many people say, I can't afford it. I want you to know I can't find any place in the Bible that says to tithe if you can afford it. <laughs> Do you know of any? Not at all. Do you know, Stephen? No. <laughs> I can't find that. I'm 77 years old, and I've never found that in reading the Bible that God said tithe if you can afford it. In Matthew 6, 31, he says to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, these things that we want to pay on and do before we tithe, he said they'll follow tithing. Amen. Too many people have the kingdom of God. They want the kingdom of God first after something else. Very few people on earth put the kingdom of God first. There was the man, you remember, who came to Jesus and he said, Lord, I want to follow thee, but permit me to go bury my father first. And Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. How many people say, oh God, I'll tithe, but suffer me first to pay off my car. Or suffer me first to pay off my home. Or suffer me first to put my children through school. Or suffer me first for one thing and another. And so the list goes on. They say, Lord, suffer me first to do this and then I'll do it. So the devil is a liar. The devil says, enjoy yourself now, but uh, he'll send the bill later. I think of, I've preached to you about the wild people of Borneo how that uh, he went there, that they were extreme poverty-stricken people. Said if they took all of their earthly belongings and put them in a five-gallon can, they would, the can would only be half full. And then he preached tithing to them. They were on a starvation basis, and he preached tithing to them. And at first he thought, oh, Lord, it's impossible, I can't do that. These people are on a starvation basis, and God wanted him to preach it. He finally did, and preached tithing to them. And they agreed to do it. And uh, he said for the first time in their lives, God gave them an abundant harvest that they had extra surplus grain to sell so they could buy, have, they weren't on a starvation diet anymore and they had f money to buy f f uh, clothes to wear. That that God worked a miracle through tithing. God said, put me first. Matthew 6, 33, put me first. There, look at the Elijah. I, I marveled that story of Elijah and the widow. First of all, I marvel that God would send the prophet Elijah down to a widow that was starving to take care of him. Well, God would send him there. Why not send him to somebody that had a storehouse? God's not dependent on storehouses. So God sent him down to the widow said, make me, and uh, when he found her, he said, will you make me a little cake? And she said, I, uh, I have only uh, about a handful of meal in a barrel and a little bit of cruise, oil in a cruise. And she said, I'm going to make that, and me and my son, she said, we're going to eat that and die. And he said, make me a cake first. Now, can you imagine that? <laughs> now, you put yourself in that position. Would you do it? <laughs> well, if you... <laughs> If you don't tithe, you surely wouldn't. <laughs> of 
Come on now. You, you would never have done it. God could never have sent a prophet to you. The miracle would never happen in your life. He said, you make me one first, and God will see if this meal lasts. And it lasted, what is it, for over a year? I don't remember just how long, but over a year. That meal, that was a handful of meal, never ran out for over a year. You talk about miracles. Why? Because you put God first. You think God's changed any? He said the same thing to you. He said, seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things that, you're, that you need will be added. He said the same thing to you that Elijah said to the widow. The very same thing. A handful of meal. What a, what a difference. How great. So, I want you to know also that if you believe in, in, if you, uh, in miracles, if you want to experience miracles, uh, you will be a believer in prayer. If you don't, there's no reason to pray. If you don't believe a miracle will take place, why pray? If you can do it, why pray? You're only praying because you can't do it. That makes me think of something. One time, D.L. Moody was praying with a group of businessmen, and they were praying for God to send in some money for something. And he looked around these men all on their knees, and he looked at the fine shoes all on head and fine. He said, hey, brethren, he said, let's quit praying. He said, there's no reason to ask God to send the money in. He said, we got it right here among us. He said, no reason to pray for money. He said, we got it. <laughs> so it's when we, we're expecting a miracle that we ask God to do something. That's why we get on our knees in the first place. That's why Brother Oliver Hogue is in Parker City. Why? We're asking for a miracle. And we're sending him because we believe in miracles. If there, what, there'd be no reason for him to be there. I think of something dear Dr. Tozer said. This. He said, the church that operates within the well-marked boundaries of security will never experience miracles. <laughs> what a tremendous privilege to be able to walk with God. Well, dear ones, I want you to know here's another thing that the church that experiences miracles, the, for the miracles to really come like they should, the church will have to come to oneness, and that in itself will bring miracles. Christ will once again have a body to work through. He's the one that works the miracles. We don't work miracles. He wants to work them. He worked them when he was on earth, and now he wants a body again to work through so that he once again can work miracles, and he doesn't send us out to work for him. He wants a body through which he can work. Brother Helm is an individual, but I want you to know that Brother Helm cannot fulfill his ministry without us. He's pointing us, trying to bring us to oneness. Why? So Christ can have a body so that he can work. God will do some miracles through Brother Helm, but that's not anything compared to what Christ will do when he has the body that he can work with. And that means every one of us filling our place in the body, every individual in the body. And no one is exempt. The eye cannot say to the ear, I don't have any need of you. Every one of us are needed. And whoever you are, the devil said, you're not important. I want you to know you're important because Christ may do some marvelous work through you. He'll do the work. You say, I can't do anything. It doesn't make any difference. He's going to do it. He wants us to put him first. So, God did the miracles. It says in the Word of God, through the hands of Paul. In the Holy Ghost awakening, we'll see many, many wonderful, mighty miracles. So I'm talking about the miracles that will happen in your individual life if you believe God and obey God. To obey God will bring miracles. Jesus said, anybody that will leave houses, fathers and, and mothers and lands and brothers and sisters and so on, for my sake, he'll receive a hundredfold. You talk about miracles to the man that'll walk with God. There are miracles there, but you're going to have to walk with God to get them. And that's you in your own personal life. I think of dear watchman Nee, who made this statement. He said, some people never see miracles because they never put anything into God's hands to work the miracle with. You remember when he was out talking to the 5,000 and they were hungry 
he said to his disciples, give them something to eat. And they said, well, we, we, there's the only, only thing that's here is a little boy with five loaves and two fishes. And he said, well, give them to me. Five loaves and two, but what, what's the difference? Get it in Jesus' hands. What, can we see what he's trying to say to you? Uh, you say, well, I don't have much, I can't do anything. Well, get it in Jesus' hands. The miracle comes when you put it in his hands. It's not the miracle's not gathering what all we have, it's putting what we have in his hands and then he works the miracle. So put your life in his hands, he'll work the miracle. Put your business in his hands, he'll work the miracle. Put whatever it is, your, everything about you, put it in his hands. Then he works the miracle. He's a God of miracles, and we're children of miracles. And the Christian religion is a miracle religion from beginning to end because it's Christ working the miracle through us. I think of dear the second Kings to the prophet Elisha. When he went to the, when the widow came to him and her husband had died, and she said, we're about my, they're about to take my boys and his slaves and bondmen, what can I do? And he said, what do you have in your house? What do you have? She said, I just got a little pot of oil. Said, that's all right, just take it. Said, what have you got? What have you got? You put it in Jesus' hands. That's what I'm trying to say to you tonight. The God is a miracle. This is a miracle church. These are miracle religions, and God wants to know what you put in his hands. He'll work the miracle with it. And many times we sit back and say, well, I just can't do anything. Well, you've got something. Put it in his hands. It doesn't make any difference what it is. That widow was just a pot of oil, and he said, that's good enough. Go borrow the vessels from your neighbors and bring them into your place and then start pouring out. And I tell you, God filled everything she brought in. Her brother was enough to take care of her and her children for as long as they lived. Why? Because she, she believed the prophet, and, and God wants to know today he's never changed. He's still the same yesterday, today, and forever. If God's with us, where are the miracles? It depends on what we put in his hands as to whether or not we see the miracles. God is still a miracle-working God. He wants to work them today, but we've got to put everything into his hands. He'll do the miracles. He'll work them.